Uh, hello, we are here today with Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. We are thrilled to have you be part of the National Cancer Prevention Workshop. Um, you have been so helpful to less cancer in our work and have been an amazing advisor, go to, and leader uh, for not only us, but for so many people and communities around the globe. And um, for the public health message. We wanted to connect today for a couple of reasons, but first, tell us how you're doing. Tell us how Flint is doing. I will. Um, Bill, it's so great to be here with you. I wish we could be in person because I would love to give you a huge hug, uh, but it's great to be able to connect virtually um, with you and your amazing team. Um, so Flint's doing okay, um, just like kind of the rest of the nation in, in terms of this pandemic. Uh, so as you can imagine, Flint was recovering from our last public health disaster and then was hit with this new public health disaster. Right. Um, so I didn't introduce, uh, yeah, I didn't give a brief clip of your bio, but for those that don't know, we all owe you a debt of gratitude for identifying the issue in Flint, Michigan. So, um, you know, um, I I'm a huge fan of your work. I'm so grateful for your, your bravery. And let me um, see, let me see right here. This is on my desk all the time, Aww. right? That's you, it's your book, The Eyes Don't See, autographed. And um, we're so grateful for what you do. But I, just to start this off, could you maybe give us a brief synopsis of how your work started several years ago. Sure, I would love to. Um, so I was uh, and continue to be a practicing pediatrician in Flint, Michigan, a professor with Michigan State University. Um, I'm based um, in, in the city of Flint and I am there on purpose as a pediatrician um, because of uh, so many of the obstacles that our children faced to be healthy. So I wanted to practice pediatrics in a place where not only could I treat ear infections, but a place where I could also address upstream inequities and injustices. And in, in 2014, Flint was in this kind of near state of bankruptcy. Um, and as such, the state came over and took democracy away from the city and the state and the city was put under something called emergency management. Um, and that was because of decades of crisis in Flint, decades of austerity driven measures that that put, you know, the the state, the city into this near bankruptcy position. Um, and the emergency managers came in in 2011 and their job was just save money, save money, save money by any means necessary. And it was decided that to save money, they would change our water source. Um, we were previously getting our water from the Great Lakes. Uh, so any Michigander, we talk about Michigan with our, with, our, with our hand, we are the mitten state, surrounded by the largest source of fresh water in the world. And in 2014, our former mayor went on TV and he changed our water source from Lake Huron to the Flint River um, in an effort to save money. And right away there was How much problem. money was that? How much money was that? Um, I don't know. I think they estimated like maybe like 80 to a hundred million dollars or something that, that would be saved. Um, but the, the greatest irony is that the, the water was switched, but it wasn't treated properly with this important ingredient called corrosion control. And that's what caused our, our crisis. The corrosion, lack of corrosion control leached lead from our pipes into the plumbing, into the bodies of our children. But if that proper treatment was added, it only would have cost about $80 a day. So for only $80 a day, we could have largely prevented this massive public health crisis. Um, but without that treatment, lead got into the water, got into the bodies of our children. And that's when I got involved when I heard the word lead. Um, as a pediatrician, as somebody trained in public health, um, we know that lead is, um, a poison. It's a it's a potent neurotoxin. It's also a form of environmental racism, environmental injustice, and mm -hmm. uh, recognizing the possibility of lead in the water really pushed me to do the research to see that if that was in, in the bodies of our children, and then very publicly shared that. Wow! Right, I know. In the book, we talk about mothers that were getting up with their babies in the middle of the night and mixing their formulas with water. 
and you know, with no idea thinking they were helping their babies, thinking they were doing everything they could for their babies. And that was not the case. What were you seeing in clinic? What were you seeing um, when you would see these children? What was the what was the tipping point? Yeah, that's a great question. And and that's one of the reasons my book is called What the Eyes Don't See, is because we weren't seeing much. Um, and that's the evilness of lead and, and the evilness of, of so many environmental contaminants is that you don't acutely see the consequences of that exposure. Um, lead is known as a silent pediatric epidemic. Um, but parents were coming in with concerns about the water um, because there were concerns that it tasted weird. It smelled funny. We had bacteria in the water. There was boil advisories. Kids were getting rashes. Um, and throughout kind of almost a year and a half of, of these concerns, there was a uh, constant reassurance that the water was okay. And even I, as a pediatrician with my long white coat on, with my doctor confidence, was reassuring my patients that, that everything was okay because in my head I was thinking, like, how could the water not be okay? Like, this is America, right? This is the 21st century. This is, you know, the richest country in the history of the world. This is, this is a city in the middle of, of the Great Lakes. Um, but more than all of that, there's rules and the regulations and, and there's people who are, are tax dollars support whose job is to protect our public health. Um, so the story of Flint, you know, is the story of a water disaster, but it's also a story of what happens when you sever the bonds between the public and government, because we all think that government's there to protect us and to keep us healthy and to guarantee things like safe drinking water and, you know, and prevention of epidemics. Uh, but this was one example, um, but also a timely example of how that failed. Doesn't seem believable, right? It seems like how could this possibly happen? But we know that when uh, legislators are not paying attention to science or, you know, um, a lot of communication gaps. Um, one thing that has really shifted, I think, for a lot of healthcare providers because of you is that you're just not that doc that people come in, you sell them a Band-Aid and you pat them on the head and send them home. You have really come out and advocated for your community. And the reason it's so important physicians such as yourself do this is because you're the ones with the education. As I always say, I'm just a C student from Wayne State University in the School of Liberal Arts, right? I, I, that's who I am. So I really don't have the tools that somebody such as yourself South has to, to, to train um, communities. And really that's what you're doing is you not only are you getting children healthy, but you're keeping them healthy. You've been involved with some programs that address some of these disparities in Flint. Can you share with me some of the things that, um, that I firsthand have seen, like your clinic or the farmer's market or any of those things? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and Bill, you are not just anybody. You are an important somebody. And that's also one of the stories of Flint is that there are so many community members who were raising concerns, but their voices were being dismissed and denied. Like heroic moms and, and pastors and journalists who are saying, hey, something's wrong. Why aren't you listening to us? Um, and it, it shouldn't have taken a doctor with a bunch of degrees after her name to finally change the course of this crisis. We should have listened to the folks on the ground um, in a very transparent, in a very representative way. Um, but because we didn't have democracy and because of the kind of the systemic injustices, the folks on the ground weren't being listened to. Um, so yeah, my story is kind of the story of what happens um, when a, a doctor and, and her titles, were her, when her voice really becomes a megaphone um, for the people that she's privileged to serve. And when I do have you know, the, the opportunity to talk with medical students and other folks in medicine, I try to reiterate the incredible, powerful um, role that we can play in communities. Um, yet too often, doctors and scientists and academics, we shelter in our cozy ivory towers and in our hospitals and our clinics, and we fail to use our very credible voice in community. Uh, when it's needed. So, you know, I, I hope that my story has been um, an inspiration for folks, especially in medicine, um, to, 
to get out of those hospitals, to get out of those, you know, Ivy, Ivy League institutions, to, to get into the community, mm -hmm. um, to work humbly shoulder to shoulder with community members, mm -hmm. to listen to their concerns and to validate their concerns um, mm -hmm. with science. Um, so in that very same spirit, that community informed, community driven, community participatory spirit, where we continue to do our work shoulder to shoulder with the impacted community, we've been able to put into place a lot of awesome in Flint, um, trying to really turn the crisis that happened in Flint into an opportunity uh, to invest in public health, to respect science, um, to eliminate inequities, and to really um, build the capacity of public health infrastructure, which has been decimated for decades. And these are the same lessons that I feel that we can learn now as a nation in this pandemic. Um, the lessons of the pandemic are very similar to the lessons of Flynn. It's, it's a story of what happens when governance fails, when governance doesn't value public health. It's a story of what happens when we don't respect science and scientists. It's a story of what happens when we fail to invest in that public health infrastructure in the, in the systems of how we keep people healthy. Um, and it's also a story of ongoing inequities. Um, so I'm, I hope that as we did in Flint, the nation can also use this crisis that we are all in as an opportunity um, to holistically respond and improve the health of our communities. It's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. I, I find as my background is, um, you know, prior to this was be, was being a, a marketing guy, a squeaky wheel guy. And and there are many gifts in being a squeaky wheel for communities. We need all the squeaky wheels we can find. However, um, it doesn't work unless we are paired with science. And what I've learned over the, you know, close to 20 years that I've been doing this is that um, public health measures are unique, different tools than what we find in the doctor's office. Sometimes they involve policy um, because that is a tool to protect public health. And sometimes policy um, becomes legislated. And we also know that not all policy or legislation becomes the reality that was intended. So, but you have to follow along and you have to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. You have to really understand what the goal is. And a lot of these measures are inconvenient. They're not convenient to do. And I think we, as an American society, we are used to reaching for our next itch. Gosh, I'm hungry, I'll grab that bag of this. Mm -hmm. or, Gosh, I need this, I'll grab this, or I'll click this, or the public health doesn't work that way. We have to do things like wear a mask. And guess what? Yeah. Wearing a mask works. And guess what? When you wear the mask, you don't get sick. It doesn't cost your family, your community. There's, But that's, you know, I think as Americans, uh, we have to really understand some of these inconveniences that um, may seem inconvenient because it's not a snap of your fingers to, to resolve something. It's not a click of your phone. Um, it's not speedy. Um, but it is, they are practices and those are the tools. And if we can get more physicians such as yourself to really talk honestly about that and understand that, yeah, it's not so easy. You know firsthand what it's like to have your kids at home for the year. You know some of these things firsthand, but you also serve these people. Yeah. So um, you have, um, can you update me at all on your farmer's market? Has that still been going? Is all of the, are some of those things yeah. that you help support an institute still have? Tell me about that. I, I would love to. So um, one of the favorite programs that we have um, in Flint is our farmer's market clinic. So our, our pediatric office is actually on the second floor of a farmer's market. Um, and we moved there on purpose to address um, you know, significant food insecurity. We have no full service grocery stores in Flint. And before we moved there, I would tell my patients, oh, you need to eat healthier. You need to eat avocados and kale and all these wonderful things. And they would just literally stare at me like, uh, Dr. Mona, where am I going to get that? And how am I going to afford that? Um, so it was because of those reasons that we made the environmental move. So healthcare made the environmental move uh, to put our clinic atop a farmer's market. Um, not only is it atop a farmer's market, it's also atop, it's also adjacent to the central bus stop in the city. 
Uh, so one of the greatest ironies um, in Flint is that, you know, we are the city that built cars. Uh, General Motors was born in Flint. Um, yet one of the greatest barriers that our patients face to, um, to their health and to get what they need is transportation. Uh, so we made this also very conscious mm -hmm. decision to be adjacent to a bus stop so our families can get to us. Uh, whenever anybody, any kid comes into the farmer's market, comes into our clinic, uh, be it for an ear infection or a well baby visit, um, they get a prescription printed on our EMR, our electronic medical record, um, for fruits and veggies, and it's subsidized. And through amazing grant support, the, the subsidy is now up to $15. So they get $15 to get fruits and veggies That's in our amazing. farmer's market. It's amazing. awesome. And, and with COVID, we've made some modifications. So not only can they go down to the farmer's market, which has been a challenge in COVID to actually go to in-person things, they can also get a food box delivered to their door of fruits and veggies wow. um, through a program called Flint Fresh, which was created um, after our water crisis wow. um, through the support of a concert. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but it was um, an anti Academy Awards concert. It was called Blackout. So it was all these amazing African American um, artists who came to Flint and put on a concert on the night of the Academy Awards wow. that, that raised a lot of money. And part of those funds went to this mobile grocery store. Um, so one of the silver linings in Flint is because of our last public health crisis, we were able to build some of the infrastructure to support families during this public health crisis, like the mobile grocery store and nutrition support and things like the Flint registry, which gets people connected to resources that they also need during this public health crisis. Um, but I'll share the kind of my last favorite thing about our nutrition prescriptions. So, you know, as academics, we've been studying it. Does it help with nutrition security? Does it help with what kids are eating? Does it help with things like BMI and obesity and all these different things? And so far, it's been very successful. And our awesome U.S. Senator, who, Bill, you also know, Debbie Stabenow, mm -hmm. um, is a huge proponent of good food and nutrition mm -hmm. and agriculture. And she's been to our clinic and she's seen kind of the evidence of what we've been able to accomplish and inspired by our nutrition prescription program, she included in the U.S. Farm Bill a national fruit and vegetable prescription, and it passed and it was signed by the president. Amazing. And now it's a $25 million fruit and veggie prescription program inspired by, by what we're doing in Flint. It's not, it's not everything, but it is something. Um, and it's one example of how what we are doing in Flint um, how we hope to really kind of share our best practices and shine a spotlight on very similar conditions that so many other folks face in different communities. Yikes, that is amazing. That's an amazing story. And I know firsthand Flint has a lot of amazing stories. There are stories of many heroes, many heroes that have fought hard for their communities and their families and done extraordinary things really fighting for their children's health in the way that um, you don't see really anywhere. And, um, you know, I am I certainly point to you for, for modeling that and, and, and really teaching those families because I think that's, a, that's your role is that you have, have been really kind of a family guide for so many of those families there and have helped them not only get well, but stay well. And that, you know, is, is critical. Is there um, any update with the Flint registry? Is there anything you can share about that? Yeah, and I would just also add that um, the families have also taught me so much. So it has been a reciprocal relationship. Um, and we've really tried to include, include the voices of families in, in all of our work. We have a parent partner group where it's actually a group of parents that represent every ward of the city and their moms and their dads and their grandparents and foster parents that meet, we meet with routinely and they share with us their, their wisdom and insight. And that has been so re rewarding. And we've even taken it a step further. We have a group of kids that also advise us, um, the Flint Youth Justice League, who are just an amazing group of children um, that we routinely How old are those meet kids? with. How old are they? They're like eight to 18. Wow. And the hardest thing for me is to close my mouth and just listen. And which is really hard because I love to talk. Um, mm -hmm. But I just sit and I listen to these amazing kids and they tell me 
um, you know, what we should be addressing and how we should be doing and, and what's important to them. So it has been a privilege working hand in hand with our families and our kids and really elevating their voices. Mm -hmm. um, and those voices are all included in the Flint Registry. So the Flint Registry is this massive CDC funded public health effort to find folks who are exposed to the water crisis, but more importantly, get them connected to things like nutrition programs and early education programs and literacy support and healthcare access and mental health services and trauma-informed care. Um, and the really exciting news is that um, it was just refunded with a new bill that uh, the Omnibus uh, Budget Bill that passed um, Congress a few weeks ago. Yep. Um, so now we're able to continue our work um, because it was about to expire. It wasn't originally a, a four-year grant. And that has uh, been renewed so that we can continue to do this long work long term. Um, the infrastructure of that registry to connect people to resources, like I said earlier, has been critical critical in this pandemic because in this pandemic, people really need food and they really need healthcare access and they need enrichments for their children. And those are the kinds of things that we've we've been able to continue uh, to connect folks to. Amazing. And now I'm thinking, tell me about how people are getting water. What's the situation with water now? It's still not totally resolved, right? Yeah, that's a great question. It's almost resolved. Right. Um, so our pipes are almost completely replaced. Um, the pipe replacement work had to go on a pause during the pandemic, but they, they're back. Uh, there's also a pause that has to happen in the winter because it's really cold in Michigan and the ground is frozen. Um, but hopefully they'll be back soon. There's only um, a couple hundred uh, homes that are, are left to be replaced, which is really amazing. Um, Flint will only be the third city in the country that has fully replaced their lead pipes. Uh, so on, it, it is amazing. Um, the, um, the EPA just finalized their federal lead and copper rule um, a, a couple weeks ago. Um, there's some missed opportunities there. It's, it's slightly stronger, um, but we're hopeful that the new administration will continue to learn the lessons of Flint and finally invest in the, in the funding uh, to support the, um, the infrastructure work to, to get rid of the lead pipes throughout our nation. Right. Right. I know our friend um, Debbie Dingell, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, is working to ban PFAS, PFOS, and in Michigan, it's now really an escalated thing. Are, is that on, how are you with dealing with that issue? Is there anything there that you could share with us? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I call them the ripple effects of Flint. So after Flint, the nation's eyes kind of really woke up to uh, water contamination issues, not just lead, but all kinds of different contaminants that we weren't really aware of before. And one of those um, has been PFAS, PFOA. So these are the kind of flame retardants that are still in use, uh, but have been widely used, especially by military and firefighters. Um, Michigan has the most uh, PFAS contamination sites in the country. And I I think it's partly because we're checking. Other states aren't, aren't even checking, but we're checking and we're finding them. And I think it's a really a problem throughout our nation. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, to identify these sites, to clean up these sites, um, and to uh, to ban the use of these, these chemicals, which, which are st still used. So our Michigan delegation has really been the national leaders in this effort. Um, I think they got their feet wet with Flint, uh, they fighting for clean water. And this is kind of the next, next step. Yep. And then that, when, that, when I, you know, was uh, with Debbie initiated the cancer prevention caucus, I think the first time I tried, I dragged in Rob a lot, who was the attorney, um, who's been involved with this mm, issue. Yeah. And um, at the time, we didn't know Michigan was, you know, number one for that. And and it is, and I'm not sure if it's number one, I don't know where it is, but it's very prevalent, very, very mm -hmm. prevalent. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you have got to stay ahead of this. I mean, it's really like every day there's something new. And you have been a little bit of a, a superhero to help address these issues and bring the attention required to address it. Because, you know, I always tell people, uh, my good intentions don't replace the intelligence of science. Like, I might not want you sick. That doesn't really mean much, except I don't want you sick. 
So I'm always telling people, my good intentions don't replace the intelligence of science and that we always have to make sure science is part of the conversation. I completely um, agree. Because we just never know where some of this stuff comes and we want to make sure that we're guided on evidence-based science. Yeah. Um, before we go today, because you've been so generous with your time, are there things that you would like to touch on that I have not talked about? Um, really, I just, I'm mm. this eternal optimist and I am hopeful and I am inspired. Um, and I really see us at this incredible moment in, in history where once again, we can take the many crises that we're facing, um, public health, economic, education, environmental, you know, democracy, the list goes on, um, and really create a moment of opportunity because of these crises. Um, we can hopefully finally invest in prevention, invest in public health, invest in, in you know, and, and push forward stronger regulations that mm -hmm. ensure, for example, our water is safe rather than, you know, decades down the line, oh, we have these chemicals we never heard of. Um, so there's a lot that we can do in this moment right now. I definitely see it as a window of opportunity um, to once again, invest in public health, to listen to science, uh, to um, to eliminate these long-standing inequities. Mm -hmm. We have, um, you know, I often think that the work for prevention, was, you know, my impetus for the work that we do with less cancer, the, the reason I started it is because I really wanted to lower suffering. I wanted to, you know, because yeah. like, even when you win a cancer battle, as they say, you're not really winning. You never yeah. come out of it. Okay. Tough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's tough. And, and, um, and so, I, but what I find is that the effort to prevent some of these chronic illnesses and cancer is that we often address those that are not heard or seen. And I'm hoping that we can start meeting some of these needs because what we know is that we have sicker people when they don't have a roof over their head, yeah. sicker people when they can't eat properly. Yeah. Bigger people yep. when they can't read. You know, literacy yep. is, a, yep. is a thing, right? So right, yep. right across the board, we can address some of these social justice yep. issues and yep. know that we will be lowering risk for chronic disease yes. and cancer yes. for forever. So exactly. your effort in lowering suffering for so many people means the world to me. And I am so grateful for your efforts because less people in the world are suffering. And I think that while some of this stuff sounds scientific and, you know, if we just go back to being good people, so many of these things can be addressed. If we're paying attention to our yeah. neighbors, if we're looking yes. at our neighbors, if we're seeing what their needs are. And I think if people understood how many millions of food insecure children we have in the country, that they wouldn't want to give a half a sandwich to them. That there's no reason that in this country we have hungry and starving children. It's unthinkable to me. But some of these basic needs must be met so we can really uh, do the best work we can in prevention. And that, you know, you've been just an incredible leader for us. And we are very grateful for everything that you do. And I hope you and your family stay safe. And um, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you, Bill. I'm... I'm privileged to do this work with you. It takes a village and um, you are leading an incredible village forward. Um, and I love how you touched on the need for empathy and really love. Um, let us make our decisions based on an empathy and love and how we care for each other. Thank right. you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Stay well. Yeah, I will. <laughs>